Welcome to Master the Book. My name is John Guyton, and this is what I learned from The Tipping Point, how little things can make a big difference. Ideas, products, messages, even behaviors, they spread just like a virus does. To explain why drastic exponential changes happen, we're gonna look at them like an epidemic. Emerging fashion trends, sudden changes in crime rates, exploding book sales, even the famous story of Paul Revere. They happen because specific people delivered the right message in the perfect conditions to create the tipping point. Just so we're on the same page here, when I say tip, tipping, tipped, tipperific, tiptastic, or any other form of tip, I'm talking about the little things that happen right before things start to change. Let's get to it. All epidemics need a mode of transmission to spread. Dangerous bacteria has a long track record of traveling by way of rodents, food, water, even the air. But ideas are spread using people, but not just anybody. A select group of individuals with specific skill sets that are responsible for the tipping of almost any social epidemic. The law of the few explains the three special types of people with incredible abilities to communicate, teach, and persuade. In the late 1960s, a psychologist by the name of Stanley Milgram conducted an experiment to find the answer to something we call the small world problem. How are human beings connected? He set out to find out if we're all just living in our own separate worlds without having any real connection to each other, or if we're all connected somehow. So to find out how a piece of information travels through the population, he sent a letter to 160 families in Omaha, Nebraska, and he told them he wanted them to send it to someone they thought would get the letter closer to one person that he chose who was a stockbroker in Boston, Massachusetts. The idea was to find out how many steps it took to get the information to that person. The average person that got it there, it happened in five or six steps. This is where the concept six degrees of separation came from. But without understanding the full story, this concept can be misleading. The six degrees of separation doesn't mean that everyone is connected to everyone else in just six steps. It means that very few people are connected to everyone in just a few steps, and the rest of us are connected to the world through those few people. So in the six degrees of separation, not all degrees are equal. Out of all the packets that arrived at the stockbroker's home, 67% of them came from one person. That person is a connector. They have a special gift for bringing people together, an instinct that helps them relate to the people they meet. Moving between different social circles and subcultures is effortless. Connectors have a special combination of curiosity, self-confidence, sociability, and energy that make them who they are. That person in your network who just knows everybody, they might just be your connector. Okay, let's play a game. I'm gonna describe someone and you try to guess who it is. This should be pretty easy. This person hopped on his horse and rode to Lexington with the important message of the British are coming. So if you guessed William Dawes, congratulations, you got the right answer. He set out to alert the local militia that the British were coming so that they would be prepared to fight the battle, just like Paul Revere did. But the message itself isn't the only thing that matters in a word of mouth epidemic. If it was, you would have heard of William Dawes, just like you heard of Paul Revere. William Dawes wasn't successful with his warning because he wasn't a connector like Paul Revere. And word of mouth epidemics are the work of connectors. Paul Revere and connectors like him are people specialists, not so much information specialists. That's another type of person. Ooh, it's not really everyday little person. It's just fancy marketing. Besides, it's 10% cheaper across the street. That person is a maven. The word maven comes from the Yiddish, and it means one who accumulates knowledge. Mavens are more than just experts. They like to be the advisors in the marketplace. They're the kind of people that just won't say, it's hot outside, they'll say, it was 87 degrees outside. They know more than most. Think of them like an information broker. They know more information than most people, and they're gonna tell you what they know. In a social epidemic, connectors help to spread the message that mavens provide. But you still need someone to persuade people when they aren't taking to the message. That's why the salesperson is so important. Energy, enthusiasm, charm, likability. Yes, the salesperson has that, but also a powerful, contagious, and irresistible Mm. trait that makes people that meet them want to agree with them. That's why I think you should give me that. 
Okay, cool. Cool. Their okay, ability to persuade people has a lot to do with emotion because emotion is contagious. Another psychologist, Howard Freeman, developed what we call the effective communication test. What it does is measures your ability to send emotion, to infect people with your mood, to be contagious. The highest possible score is 117. The average score is around 71. For reference, I scored a 106. All right, this is pretty interesting. The experiment then paired the high scorers with the low scorers and put them in a room. They were told to sit in a room together for two minutes. They could look at each other, but not talk. The results found in just two minutes, the low scorers adopted the mood of the high scorer. It worked that way when the high scorer was happy and when they were sad, it didn't matter. And it only worked in one direction. The high scorer never adopted the mood of the two low scorers in the room. So back to those scores. Looks like the magic number is 90. When people score 90 or more, they start to infect people with whatever emotion they're feeling. Pretty cool, right? The law of the few tells us that in a social epidemic, the nature of the messenger plays a critical role in how this information is spread. But the message itself has to be compelling. It has to be something that people can take action on. I mean, take Paul Revere, for example. He had a message that said, the British are coming. Imagine if he had a different message. Would it be as effective? The content has to be memorable for sure, but it also has to be good enough for them to take an action. We call this the stickiness factor. While I move my camera over a few feet, watch these clips and tell me if you can guess the TV show. Hi, Sally. What are you doing helping school uh -huh. so early? Um, had a teacher's meeting, was called off, oh. so I just brought Sally around. She's if you guessed it correctly after that little snippet, I'm impressed. For the rest of you, here's another little clip from the same show. <laughs> this is Sally. Hi, Sally. This is Ariana. Hi, Sally. And that's so maybe that clip was all you needed to get it right. No? Here's one more that should do the trick. Yeah. Well, I've been invited to join the Good Birds Club. Look familiar now? That's right, Sesame Street. This show's been on the air for over 40 years, airs in over 120 countries, has won eight Grammys and 120 Emmys, all because they recognized the stickiness factor. But it didn't start out that way. They committed themselves to testing for stickiness. Things were a little shaky at first, but they finally got things to tip when they did one little thing added Big Bird. Minor changes can create major stickiness. One day, a psychologist wanted to do an experiment to see if they could convince college students to get their tetanus shots. They made up a brochure showing all sorts of information and gave it to the students. Nearly all of them had a good understanding of tetanus, the dangers of it, and why they should go get the shot. But only 3% actually went and got one. So they made one minor change and did the test again, and this time, 3% turned into 28%. What was the change? It was a map to the clinic and the hours that they were open. Minor changes can create major stickiness. It's probably pretty likely that you've heard of Empire Carpets. That's because they spent mountains of money marketing. The idea was they wanted to make sure that everyone knew their phone number. Let's have a listen. Right. All right, now get out there and install. 588 empire People remembered the phone number. The problem is they weren't actually calling. So they made minor change after minor change until they figured out the stickiness factor. Five, eight, eight, two, three, hundred. Oh. You get delivery in three to four days. Sometimes shorter. Five, eight. Come on, do it. Five, eight. Well, you better remember Empire. Or the boogeyman will get you. You know, I've been wondering why it is you haven't called us yet about that new carpeting you need. I don't want to pay extra for padding and installation. So call Empire. I'm, I'm calling, calling Empire. Empire. If you call now, you get a free Empire t-shirt with your order. So for Pete's sake, don't go to them. Call us. Bye, baby. So after lots of failed attempts, they finally found the magic formula. And it was so close to their original tune, it was actually just one word. 800 588 Empire Today. You already know what I'm going to say. Minor changes can create major stickiness. There is a simple way to package your information so that under the right conditions, it creates the stickiness factor. You just have to find it. The law of the few tells us how important the connector, the maven, and the salesperson are in spreading ideas. The stickiness factor reminds us that the message still needs to be compelling. The power of context 
is an environmental argument. When things happen, we have to consider the time, place, situations, and circumstances under which they occurred. What if I told you two athletes attempted to toss a bottle cap into a bowl? Athlete A made all 10 bottle caps. Athlete B only made two. Who would you say is the better athlete? Context is critical. You see, here's the thing. Most of us seem to have a pretty consistent character because we're really good at controlling our environments. I like to have fun at dinner parties, so I throw a lot of dinner parties. My friends come and they see me being fun and they think I'm fun. But what if I didn't throw dinner parties? What if I couldn't or I was always in situations that were stressful or dangerous and I didn't have much control over my surroundings? My friends probably wouldn't see me as fun anymore. Context is critical. Groups have the power to magnify the epidemic potential of a message or an idea. That's exactly what groups did for the divine secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood. The book has sold over two and a half million copies and has over 48 printings. Gore & Associates is a company with no formal hierarchy. They all have the same title no matter how long they've been there. They make their own commitments and rely on each other to get things done. It's been working since 1958 with over $3 billion in yearly revenue and over 10,000 employees. But since we know that context is critical, there is one important rule for groups that you should remember and respect. It's rooted in science and decades of research. It's the Rule of 150, which simply but firmly states that groups should be no more than 150 people. Gorn Associates takes this so seriously. Instead of having one massive building for all their employees, they have over 70 spread across town with no more than, you guessed it, 150 employees in each one. Okay, one more example about context. This is a chart showing the crime rate in New York over a 30 year span. Speaking of crime, you hear those sirens? <laughs> Pretty fitting. In 1965, there were 200,000 serious crimes in New York, and things were especially bad in the subways. That number increased over a 10 year span to the mid 600,000s and stayed there for nearly two decades until 1992. It suddenly drops all the way to 350,000 in just a five year span. But why? Well, it turns out that seemingly insignificant crimes were the gateway to more serious ones. In New York, subway cars were 100% covered in graffiti, and there were an estimated 170,000 people entering the subways every day without paying their fare. The power of context says that you can prevent crime by simply scrubbing off graffiti and arresting fare beaters. Context is critical. That's a lot of information. We should do a recap. Yeah. Okay, ideas are spread using people, but not just anybody. The law of the few tells us how important the connector, the maven, and the salesperson are in spreading ideas. The stickiness factor reminds us that the message still needs to be compelling. Minor changes can create major stickiness. There is a simple way to package your information so that under the right conditions, it creates the stickiness factor. You just have to find it. The power of context is an environmental argument. When things happen, we have to consider the time, place, situations, and circumstances under which they occurred. Groups have the power to magnify the epidemic potential of a message or an idea. Groups should be no more than 150 people. Context is critical, and emotion is contagious. Ideas, products, messages, even behaviors, they spread just like a virus does. Oh, okay, cool. Cool, cool. Tipping points remind us of the potential of change. With the right people, the right message, the right conditions, who knows what's possible. I hope this was helpful for you. I'm John Guyton and this is Master the Book. But your body has to face us. Your body's facing us and your head's looking. Tipping points remind us of the potential. That's a siren. I'm going to wait for the siren. I'm thirsty. I'm going to get like, 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 like,